Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. We're just looking at an article from the Banner of Truth on how do, how do so many preachers fail to connect and I just want to look at uh, how the failure of some preachers uh, with the view to helping us to preach better. Uh, the article is by Stuart Ollier. Uh, you can go and read it on the Banner of Truth um, website, uh, magazine website. So. Let's come before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day. And uh, Father God, I, I just praise you and thank you for this day. And Father, I just pray that you bless um, this Lord for your glory. And I just pray that this video would help people to be better preachers. And uh, I just pray that you would encourage Father in your name and for your glory. Amen. Uh, Stuart Ollie has a, a website called Know Your Bible. Um, so if you type in Know Your Bible, Stuart Ollie, you'll find some excellent material there, uh, both for your discipleship and to encourage you about preaching. Also, Stuart Ollie has written a couple of books uh, on preaching, so look out for them. Uh, so that's Stuart Ollie at uh, Stuart Ollie at O L Y O T T. Uh, he's a well known preacher in the UK. Uh, from a uh, Reformed Baptist perspective. Now we're just going to do a few minutes um, concerning this article. He says, I'm a troubled man. There is something dangerously wrong with a great deal of modern preaching. Countless Bible-loving preachers are failing to connect. And so he says, so what is wrong? I need to say straight away that the content of the messages are being sound enough. Yes, it's true that too many men preach what they see in the passage rather than what the passage says, but that does not explain the failure to connect. Yes, it's always true that many preachers do remain close to the passage in front of them, but rather preach thoughts that come to them from all over the place. But even a man who does that can surely learn to connect with his listeners. So Stuart Elliott thinks that the issue is connected. I think that is a particular problem in the Reformed tradition. Um, I don't think it's a problem in the charismatic tradition. The charismatic tradition are very good at connecting, but very weak in theology. So you as a charismatic preacher need to address that as an issue. It's all right connecting with people and getting on their level, which I've seen many charismatic preachers do very, very well. But where's your content? How much of it's biblical? And are you theological in in the in the sense that are you teaching good sound theology? You say, well, they don't need theology; they just need a few thoughts, a new inspiration. No, 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 no. People need the Bible. They need to be built up in the Word of God. And you, as a preacher, a charismatic preacher, need to be feeding the flock of the Word of God. So it's not just about connecting here. It's about theology. But in this context, Stuart Elliott's a Reformed Baptist preacher, and he's saying that the Reformed Church is not connected. I think that's true. I think many churches in conservative evangelical churches don't realize that things have changed now, that people have moved on. People don't have the same background as they used to in, in the Bible. So you need to realize things have changed, and you need to preach to the culture accordingly. That doesn't mean to say you downgrade theology, because I've just said to the charismatic preachers that you need theology. But what it means is you need to get that theology and Bible teaching and, and reduce it to a level that people can relate to. Yeah. So Stuart Elliott says, so it is something to do with communication skills. Many of you will know that I have had a lot to say about this over the years. I have campaigned for men to look to people in the eyes and to preach to them simple sermons using ordinary words, short sentences, and plenty of questions. I have pleaded for more illustrations, especially for more use of narrative and story. I have urged men to realize that preaching is about change, and so to give themselves to addressing people's conscience. I am glad to note that a handful of preachers have listened to me. Some of these connect well, and one or two of them connect exceptionally well, but there are others who don't connect at all, despite their improvement in these areas. So the failure to connect, connect cannot be explained simply by pointing to poor communication skills. He goes on, at this point somebody is going to interrupt and say something like this, it's obvious what is wrong, what preachers need is the spirit, 
when it comes upon them, the preaching will take on a new quality. They will speak with authority, persuade people's minds, stir their emotions, and reach their hearts. That is what our forefathers called unction. To all that I can say, Amen, I wouldn't detract from it in any way at all. Many modern preachers know nothing of conquering God in the secret place, and then going out to speak for him with power and conviction. If they had been doing that, I would certainly not be writing this article. I'm not too sure, Stuart, I like that word, conquering God. I think you mean pleading with God. But then he goes on to his first point, that preaching is relational. It is now seems to me that there are two main reasons for this failure. The first reason is that men forgot that preaching is relational. How can I explain this? They look upon the men and women in the congregation as people to speak to, rather than people to relate to. They see them simply as hearers and not as people to know and to love. What is wrong here then is the preacher's attitude. He is a message from God. This message is intended for creatures made in God's image. But the preacher himself, through whose lips that message will come, is also made in that image. So although the message is divine, the normal rules of human communication apply. I totally agree. I think that a lot of reform preaching is often called. It's called because the preacher often looks at the people as just people to preach to, as Stuart Olliot says, rather than people to love. He writes, uh, so although preaching is proclamation, it is not just proclamation, it is conversation, it is dialogue. He goes on, does this mean that we can't preach to people unless we know them? No, not at all, but it means that we speak to people in such a way that we communicate the fact that we want to know and love them. We give our message, but we also give ourselves. Paul says, Christ's love compels us. Our manner is engaging, friendly, pastoral, inviting, without any way being distant or patronizing. As we continue to preach, the congregation senses not only that it is receiving a message from God, but also that it is getting to know his messenger. They look upon him less and less as a stranger. They open their hearts to him. They begin to look on him uh, of, one, of one who belongs. So, I, I think Stuart Olliot has pressed upon a really important point. When you think of our Lord, he was, a, he, was a, he, he was around people, encouraging people, showing them practical love. He wanted to be around people. He wanted to share people's lives. Very often, it's very easy as a preacher to have a castle mentality where you're in your castle, your throne of the pulpit, where you're surrounded with your books and your theology and all the rest, and you cocoon yourself uh, in a theological castle, and you go out to preach, and you come home, and you've got your books and, and, and what have you, and I think it's important, what Stuart Ollie is saying, to, to have a love for humanity, to be willing to walk with them and to communicate that in your preaching. It's very easy to make that mistake, uh, and I think it's really important to correct it. He talks about in Acts 17 that Paul says men of Athens, that Paul shows a desire to engage with people on their level. He goes, they avoid almost every sign of humor, are afraid ever to enjoy themselves or to weep in the pulpit shrink from open display of love or concern and seem quite content to remain somehow distant from people they are speaking to. No wonder they fail to connect. I think this is reform preaching, a description of the reform preacher. Uh, it's not, it, it is not the preaching of many evangelicals. A lot of evangelicals are warm in their preaching, are passionate in their preaching. And uh, charismatic preachers, especially so. But I do think that it's that genuine care, that genuine love for people is important. Whether you're charismatic or reformed or generally evangelical, we are not there to give philosophical lectures, we are to communicate the truth, and communicating the truth is communicating it with the love. So Stuart Olliot goes on. But there is a second reason for the failure to connect. Besides getting that preaching is relational, they also forget that it is incarnational. 
Once more, I am a bit stuck as to how to explain this. Perhaps the best way is to think of someone telling a story. As it begins, we are more conscious of the teller than we are of the story. But as things proceed, everything changes. The story begins to grip us. We visualize its characters, enter their world, see their problems, and wonder what is going to happen. The story fades from view. The world of the story becomes our real world. When the story ends, we say, aha. We say it loudly because of our obvious disappointment. The time has come to leave the world of the story, to blink our eyes, and to return to our dull, everyday life. The story teller has done his job, and he has done it well. He has been heard, but he has hardly been seen. It was the story that grabbed us, held us, and moved us, but there would have been no story if there had not been a storyteller. It was because he did it, as he did it, that we are so enthralled. He was so much part of the story, he was so much in it, that we soon forgot him, although it was only to him that we were listening. At some point, we as hearers crossed an inevitable line. From that point on, it was impossible for us to separate the teller of the story, and even if he had been telling a story written by somebody else, we would not have objected. If he had called it my story, the story... The, the teller was the story, and the story was the teller because the story is incarnational. So is preaching. This perhaps why, explains why Paul, in expanded the divinely revealed gospel to the Romans, calls it my gospel. That is, it may, it is certainly true, the great numbers of modern preachers, possibly the majority of them, do not see preaching as incarnational. They believe the message, they even live by it, but as they sound that message, they see it as something separate from themselves. To them, the preacher is the man who stands in the pulpit. The message is what is written on his notes, and he is here to give that. In his mind, he is like a postman. He is a message to deliver. We turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. I think, again, it's that emotional dista uh, detachment. You know, there are preachers in the reform school of preaching that can be detached and try to be logical and, 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 and the rest of it. Um, it. It's that cool, detached mentality, but I think that, again, is principally a reformed problem. It's not a general evangelical problem. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. But when we preach, we should give our all. We do not preach about ourselves, but we preach that Jesus is Lord and that we are servants of Jesus. Yeah, we, we don't preach ourselves, but, but for Paul, the gospel was everything, and he was committed to the gospel. It was my gospel. Um, says the love of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 the love of Christ controls us because we know that one died for all so all have died so the love of Christ controls us in other words this is not a cold detached preaching but it is a warm preaching again it's it's very similar to what Stuart Olliott was saying before it's relational but he's asking for a bit more that we put our whole being in the preaching and I think if you don't put your whole heart and mind and soul into your preaching then you're not really going to connect in your preaching if you're seen as cold and distant and then finally he writes how then does all this affect preaching well a truly biblical preacher realized that he is completely identified with the gospel message that he preaches what happens to that message will also happen to him this sort of word serving Charm offensive is sadly lacking in modern pulpit and is one of the main reasons why so many men are failing to connect. Even men who are captivating in personal conversation seem unable to carry their appealing ways into the pulpit. As they open up the word of God to the adults and children in front of them, they come across as stiff, artificial, austere, detached, formal, laboured, standoffish, unrelaxed and wooden. Again, I think that is a problem of reform preaching um, it's because of the middle class culture uh, and 
the kind of cultural understanding of the Puritans and the Reformers that we are men of God and we are following the Word of God and we are using the Puritans. Uh, and so I think Stuart Olliot there is describing a problem um, of the reform community there. And I think the answer to the reform community and, and preaching is, is to really commune with God and to understand the gospel as you claim to understand and understand that that if you really believe that Christ took the wrath that we deserve, then you should communicate that, and your being should be in it. Yeah? Other issues in preaching that I see today, uh, that I've seen, I want to say in the charismatic word of faith movement, uh, there are some problems in preaching there. <coughs> I think that... Um, too often the word of faith movement and the preachers in that kind of movement preach far too much experience. I think it's good to connect but it's all about their experience and many of these preachers become the hero of their own sermons. They will tell long stories about themselves and it's these stories that, that they're trying to communicate rather than actually the word of God. So very often the Word of God is just not expounded. In fact, it's hardly ever expounded. <coughs> the Word of Life preachers, the charismatic preachers, will bring out a few verses here and there. <coughs> it, will, <coughs> it will have some biblical content. But I do think that on balance there's no real exposition of the Word of God. I'm saying this from experience. I was in a Word of Life church for about a year and a half, two years, and I... I was able to see regular preaching of many Word of Life preachers from around the world uh, in the faith movement, and I was able to watch them, listen to them, and hear what they had to say. And predominantly, this kind of preaching is based on experience, uh, and there's no expositional preaching of the Word of God. There's no bringing the text and expounding the text in its context. Um, the second thing is in the word faith movement preaching very few times very few times is the cross preached about the wrath of God and judgment and so the gospel is not fully preached about heaven and hell it's all about Christ can make you well Christ can make you better it's all therapeutic preaching it, it's not preaching that's dealing with sin and judgment and the need to get right with God and also there is very little uh, holiness preaching. Again, it's all about relationships, how about how you can get on in your life, etc. But there's very little about being holy, how to be pure and how to live a holy life and how to how God can help you to live a holy life. So that, that these are two big problems in the in the word of faith uh, faith movement in America and the UK. Uh, how, uh, to counterbalance that. I would encourage you, as Word of Faith preachers, um, I would encourage you to uh, read um, read John Stott's book on the cross. Now, I don't agree. I don't agree with John Stott. Sorry about that. That's, I'll just leave that. I'll answer it in a minute. I don't agree with John Stott's annihilationism. Totally disagree with that. I think that's wrong. Uh, I believe in the doctrine of hell. Read uh, Shedd's book, uh, The Doctrine of Hell, PDF you can get. But John Stott wrote a great book on the cross. Um, and I would encourage preachers to go and listen, uh, go and read that book. And when you're preaching, use some of the biblical material that he, he brings out about the cross. Um, and I would go uh, to, if you go to Wesley Studies, um, and go and read some of the old magazines. You can download them, the really old magazines from 1920s, 
1924, uh, and look at some of the papers there on how they preached, what they were preaching about on holiness. And I would encourage you to do that. Uh, the Wesley Studies is a Manchester uh, fellowship, uh, scholarly fellowship, and there they have um, uh, scholarly resources on Wesleyanism, and you can find um, some excellent material. Uh, I would encourage you to go and listen to um, Lloyd Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones uh, Recording Trust, and listen to uh, his series on preaching and preachers. It's a very good series. And also, John Piper's uh, Desiring God Ministries, there are some excellent lectures on preaching there and about preaching. Also, if you want to see good modeled preaching modeled, I would go and listen to the sermons on Together for the Gospel, uh, especially 2014, uh, Al Muller, uh, John MacArthur, David Platt, and people like that, and listen to them and see how they preach. Um, so, preaching better, remember it's relational. Remember you're communicating to people, not to uh, you should care for. Remember to preach with your whole being and uh, not to be cold and standoffish. But don't fall into the trap of the word of faith movement where there's no theology. Have some content. Get into the Bible and expound it in its context. And I want to address general evangelicalism. I think there are some dangers in general evangelicalism in preaching. Um, I think the older preachers need to realize well, a couple of things. The older preachers need to keep preaching. The older preachers seem to be bowing out. I don't think you should bow out. Keep going as a preacher. You need to realize that the evangelical churches have changed. Many of the evangelical churches don't know very much. You haven't got the biblical reference of, of evangelicals 20, 30 years ago. So what that means is you can't assume that they know what you're talking about. And you can't assume young people know what you're talking about. So you've got to fill in the gaps for them. You know, you, it's like you as a preacher know about giving people meat and giving people milk, yeah? Well, you've got to give meat at a milk level. You've got to feed people good, solid food, but at a, a level that they can relate to. And many people in the churches today are at the milk level. So if you've got young people in your congregation, they're not going to understand where you're coming from. So you need to go down to their level, use illustrations, think where they're at, and then try and bring in biblical truth to that level. You don't compromise the biblical truth, but you need to reduce it so that the people can understand it. And that means a lot of people in your congregation and you think understand the gospel, understand things, I'm telling you that most of them won't understand. And so you need to keep going over the same ground, you need to fill in the gaps for them, you need to help them to understand. And this is the biggest problem facing a lot of evangelical churches today, that people don't realize that their own congregations don't know as much as you think they know. I think the other problem uh, couple of problems uh, that need to be addressed with preachers today. There are two, uh, there are a couple of types of preachers around today. There are the trendy preachers who are culturally aware, knowing what's going on, but they're influenced by the new theologians and new ideas and they're moving away and have moved away from evangelicalism, uh, uh, from the gospel. And I want to say to you kind of preachers that I've, I, I've seen, I, I say this again, I've seen over 10 years in theological education, I have seen theologians and pastors move in your direction, and they are nowhere now. You cannot build churches on this kind of stuff. You need to come back to the gospel and biblical truth. But I want to say to those who are more orthodox that you're, you've got your head in your sand that you're not aware of what's going on and you need to be aware you need to know what people are thinking you need to know what the culture is 
thinking and you need to make sure that you're responding to the culture and what the culture is saying but from a biblical perspective so be more aware of what's going on now I want to say uh, for both of you the trendy ones and the more sound and conservative to pull back to get deep roots to get into more prayer to get into more study to get deeper into a prayer and deeper into study because we're going into a real battle in these next 10 years in the West and we need to be strong in the Word of God we need to be rich in the Word of God so I'm encouraging you as preachers to get into the Word of God more than you've ever got into it and get on your knees and be praying more than you've ever done before there's got to be a lot of prayer now a lot of intercession and we've got to get into that word even more and get the messages from God secondly get into the great 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 riches of the church okay get into the early church fathers the early church fathers are neglected they will enrich your preaching and your pastoral ministry get into reading uh, Irenaeus Ignatius Polycarp and all these great early church fathers and the, the Nicaea fathers such as uh, Athanasius get into reading the Reformation theologians Luther Luther's sermons are awesome get into reading John Calvin's uh, works yeah and then get into reading the Puritan writers the great Thomas Watson and many of the great Puritan writers will enrich you and strengthen you and then you've got the 17th century John Wesley George Whitfield Charles Simeon read these writers and get rich and rooted into them read the missionary biographies of William Carey uh, David Brainard Adonai Judson you can get many of these on Desiring God Ministries L go and listen and read the sermon re read the sermons of Charles Spurgeon listen to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preaching you can listen to him on uh, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones recording trust what I'm saying is get rich and deep into the Word of God and rich into the Christian tradition uh, traditions where you can be sustained and strengthened in your ministry some great theology books to read Calvin's Institutes uh, Herman Bavinck's Dogmatics volume 1 2 3 and 4 uh, Alain, uh, uh, Joseph Elaine's Alarm to the Unconverted yeah John Bunyan's sermons Whitfield's diary read Whitfield's diary that will inspire you as a preacher so these are the things that you can be doing you need to get deep now in the Word of God there is a series at the uh, Puritan Theological Seminary on sermon audio there's a series by Joel Beek on preaching which will be excellent for you to listen to and will will, will inspire you um, but the, these are going to be tough days as preachers and in tough days you need to you need to get deep go and listen to the sermons of Stuart Ollier and Jeff Thomas these are the things that you need to do um, take a concord uh, take a, a pen and read through the Gospels and mark down how the Lord Jesus preaches and copy him not many preachers have done that take a pen and go through the Gospel of Acts and note how the preachers in the gospel uh, in the book of Acts preach this will help you immensely in your preaching okay I've also done a lecture on homiletics it's very academic uh, very deep and academic and a couple of uh, on Lollard preachers uh, and that goes into the academic issues of preaching and tackles some of the attacks that academia have, have done on preaching and I give a defense of preaching uh, from an academic point of view uh, on Lollard preachers uh, it, it's a very very extensive academic lecture I would not advise you to listen to it unless you want some like intellectual defense of preaching against academia uh, and the attacks on preaching and that's filtered to the church so you get people in church saying we don't need preaching today and this lecture is to facilitate an intellectual defense of preaching 
Um, so there's a lecture there, but also there are lots of things that I've said on preaching that can help you. Um, but I think there are just some basic things that you need to know about preaching. Number one, pray. Number two, live a holy life. Number three, get your messages from the Bible. Study the Word of God, expound it faithfully. Number three, make an outline that's simple. Put it simple illustrations. Have three points. Make it simple. Don't be clever. Just make it simple. And when you're preaching it, depend on the power of God. And preach it with all your heart. And preach it for the, for the glory of God and for the needy. Uh, you'll be a powerful preacher. I promise you that. Okay, so that's Stuart Olliot's article. I hope you've found it a blessing. Uh, go on the Banner of Truth, look up Stuart Olliot, and list, read some of his articles, and you'll find them a blessing. And I hope um, this is this has helped you to preach a little bit better. I hope it stimulated you, encouraged you to go forward. I just want to say, I want to say this as preachers in the evangelical churches around the world today. That we're going to go through the fire. We're going to go through the fire, yeah? And the way to get through the fire is to have deep roots. So you pre as preachers, the best thing you can do at the moment is, is gird up the loins of, of your mind. Is to realize we're going to go through the fire as preachers. Especially in the churches, you're going to have a difficult time as pastors and preachers in the churches. You're going to find it really, really tough. You're going to go through a very, very difficult time in the churches. You're going to go through a backlash of people standing up against you who are not agreeing with the evangelical message in the church. And you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be downhearted. So you need to get deep in prayer you need to get deep in the Word of God deep in church history and then you'll be able to stand and you'll be able to turn the tide and I believe we will see a tide turning I believe we will see revivals in the West I believe we'll see great things happening in the West because we have a great God but it's going to be a tough time but it's going to be a blessed time we're going to see fruit and blessing we're going to see fruit and blessing like we've never seen before in the West but we're going to have to pay the price we're going to have to suffer as preachers so get deep in prayer get deep in the word get deep in the early church fathers the reformers and the Puritans in Spurgeon and Lloyd Jones get deep and get ready for blessing but get ready for opposition alright God bless you and take care <laughs>